Good morning. Uh, for those of whom I haven't yet met, I'm uh, Mitchell Adams. I live on Pinckney Street and I'm a member of Beaker Beacon Hill Village. Um, it has also been my privilege to serve as a member of the Board of Trustees of Partners in Health. Um, a couple of housekeeping keeping, uh, matters. Um, we, we're going to have two speakers and then a, uh, a period of questions and answers. If you uh, want to ask a question, click on uh, chat and then type in your question uh, and it will be addressed um, in the question and answer period. Also, um, we're going to be looking at slides and we're going to uh, see uh, the, uh, the, the, the face of the speaker. If you want to look at the slides and the speaker side by side, uh, go to the view selection, uh, view options, and click side by side, and that will give you uh, give you what you want. Uh, we have two distinguished speakers this morning, uh, Dr. John Welch and Dr. Robert uh, Bran Branson. Let me give you a brief capsule of their uh, their bios. Uh, Dr. John Welch is executive director of the Massachusetts Community Tracing. A collaborative and the Director of Operations and Partnerships for the Partners in Health Mass COVID Response. Uh, John is also a senior nurse anesthetist and is Director of the Pediatric Nurse uh, Anesthesia Fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. He's a former Chief Clinical uh, Officer of PIH's Ebola response in West Africa and started with PIH in 2013. Uh, as the perioperative services coordinator in Haiti, uh, where he helped establish the nurse anesthesia education program at PIH's University Hospital at Mir Ballet. He holds a doctorate in nurse practicing uh, uh, and a bachelor's in nursing science from Ohio State University and a master of science in nurse anesthesia uh, from Boston College. Uh, Dr. Robert uh, Bramson, uh, is a member of Beacon Hill uh, Village, as many of you, as many of you may know. He is a, he's a case investigator for the Massachusetts Community Tracing Collaborative. Um, uh, recently retired, he was for many years executive chairman and associate radiologist in chief uh, in the Department of Radiology Children's Hospital of Boston. Uh, previously, he was head of the Division of Pediatric Radiology. Department of Radiology at the MGH uh, and Director of Radiology at the Shriners Burns Institute in Boston. Uh, he was also Associate Professor of Radiology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bramson received his MD from Washington University uh, School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, just very briefly before they begin, um, let me make a couple of uh, remarks about partners in health. Um, uh, I like to put it this way. All of the angels are on the side of partners in health because their mission is to bring health care to the poorest people in the world. They do this with a model that is efficient, effective, and replicable. Globally, PIH has about 19,000 employees of which 90% are community health workers. Do we have that slide of the, of the world? Just, there it is. Uh, so these are the locations in the, in the world. You can see them there. Uh, uh, West Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, and Liberia, Lesotho, Malawi, Rwanda, and uh, uh, also Peru, uh, Mexico, um, and so forth. Um, their involvement with the mass COVID-19 stems from the fact that they were the, the agency asked to solve the crisis of Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and because they were born out of the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. But I leave more of that story to our first speaker, Dr. John Welch. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, it's a real treat and a pleasure to, to be here this morning with you all. Uh, I appreciate the, the introduction. and. I also love when uh, my different worlds collide and, and I get to spend some time with a, a, a children's colleague as well. So uh, Dr. Bramson, it's a, a real pleasure to be with, uh, with you today as well. Um, 
so you can you can see here where where PIH works, and I think um, those of you familiar with our work uh, might recall uh, just a few short years ago when we added to the map Liberia and Sierra Leone uh, nearly simultaneously, um, and this came after um, while one of our uh, co-founders, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, was president of the World Bank and. Um, there was, while I wasn't in attendance at this meeting, I've heard it recounted that there was a rather um, uh, vibrant discussion about the need for um, individual organizations and, and countries who have the, the capacity to help in West Africa during that horrific Ebola epidemic. Um, but they really have a responsibility to do that. And I think PIH though we are not traditionally an emergency response organization, we see in so many of these uh, emergencies and particularly epidemics like Ebola, that re really what's happening there is just the, um, the spotlight on the effects of systemized and systematic marginalization and uh, sort of um, unencumbered poverty uh, and that you know, those are, those are the things that really lead to um, a, an epidemic like Ebola just starting from a small spark and creating a, a massive, um, massive forest fire. So PIH responded to that. I was very fortunate um, to be asked to be part of that early response. Um, and uh, we... Um, uh, unlike some of our, our times in the past, we sort of uh, entered into two countries simultaneously, which was a big lift um, for us working in this, in this emergency response space. Um, so that was uh, kind of also what led me down this path to being part of the, the COVID response as well, which we'll get to in a moment, but uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> So, our th this is our this is our COVID response work. But I think that this, as I've as I started uh, alluded to, that this was born out of uh, the work that PIH has done for decades around epidemic response. Um, and it's not uh, you know for for us to develop a, a strategy to think about the way that we were going to tackle COVID around the world. Um, is no different than the way you know Paul and Ophelia and Jim looked at uh, tuberculosis or uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and HIV, which is really to use public health um, as the as the science and use uh, the sort of overarching framework of accompaniment as uh, the engine, right? As the as the um, the, the model for care. And accompaniment is that, that piece that PIH does so well. And in fact, um, in, a, in a minute or two, when we talk about uh, how we think about this work, uh, the COVID work here in Massachusetts, it becomes really important as well. But, you know, accompaniment is really the, um, is really the, uh, the glue that holds all of our work together around the world. And, uh, I apologize for the background noise. I live quite close to the <laughs> to the hospitals. Um, so uh, accompaniment, is, accompaniment is really this glue that sort of holds our, our work together around the world. And it's not just um, sort of the, 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 the accompaniment from uh, the United States uh, to the global South, but that uh, there's, there's the need, particularly that we're seeing now, for some reciprocal learning as well. And, um, you know, Paul describes this beautifully as sort of reverse innovation, where all of this time and effort and, and investment that we've made in, in uh, the world, uh, and some of you have, have made in the organization, is actually um, to now our own, <laughs> our own benefit, right? And that uh, sort of importation of the learnings of using public health and the public health tools to fight these types of epidemics in settings where we continue to work to build uh, equitable health systems 
uh, is really now at a, a great benefit to the United States. So this test, treat, trace model uh, made perfect sense for us. And this was really kind of, um, you know, for us, the way that we looked at uh, tackling our global COVID response. And, um, and that's kind of how we, how we uh, set foot off into, into Massachusetts. Um, and I think the most important piece of this slide is um, the final bullet point there, which is to demonstrate to the world that with aggressive action, um, that, that you can achieve good outcomes and really contain and control the spread of COVID, but it takes that aggressive action. And that's one of the things that um, I think if we all take a step back and reflect, uh, um, that's been difficult even in the United States to achieve. I mean, um, we're looking at a very short history of um, PPE being sort of uh, taken from the hands of states and uh, reallocated despite their, their tough, uh, their hard work to, to um, uh, um, to procure that stuff. And, and, and I think, you know, PIH has struggled with that. Even in our global response, we've, we've had to work um, to overcome lots of uh, exportation rules, um, lots of, um, you know, sort of embargo on things being, being moved um, around the world during this tough time. So, um, the, 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 the baseline though is that we as an organization, this, this model, this test, treat, trace, a company makes perfect sense to us. We've used it uh, many times over. Um, we can go to the next slide. And I love, I'll just, I'll say that that last slide, um, you can go back to it, sorry. Um, I love seeing, uh, uh, that's, that's a photo taken in front of um, uh, University Hospital Mirabelay in, in uh, the central plateau. And um, I see a couple familiar faces despite the masks there. And it just, uh, it, it's, that's, that's where my relationship with Partners in Health started. Uh, so it's lovely to, to see um, the, the front gate of, of HUM there. Um, okay, now we can go to the next slide. So, you know, similar to, to the moment where uh, sort of Jim Kim was uh, working at the World Bank during the, the Ebola response and things were getting worse and there were, you know, there were models predicting million, you know, a million plus cases and just really, really horrific uh, projections. Uh, it, it came to the moment that there was a uh, sort of, a call for moral courage, I'd say, for organizations who don't live in that emergency response space um, to take what we what they know and um, and to invest um, invest uh, time or 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 um, lessons learned or as PIH did actually invest in in Ebola response and for for us that looked like doing three things. Um, we, you know, we were first tasked with the thing that I think uh, is pretty tricky for PIH, which was to mount an, an emergency Ebola response. Um, very rapid scale up of a clinical staff um, to find uh, public sector partners who were already working in the Ebola space and try to uh, amplify the work that they were doing. But to do that in, in um, this sort of uh, rapid way in a place where PIH hasn't worked before, right? And so that was our work in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. I'll just caveat that by saying I think PIH does a very good job of responding to emergencies in places where we're well established. Um, you know, certainly poverty itself is an emergency and we witness day after day, um, things that would be relatively minor um, sort of uh, um, situations in, in a place with a well-established health delivery system 
uh, really challenge and stretch the, the health delivery systems in the countries where we work. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, um, mudslides of a couple of years ago, or um, perhaps flooding, or as we saw um, in, in Haiti, back with Hurricane Matthew, these sorts of things, right? Um, those, those situations really stretch uh, health delivery systems in poor countries, but PIH is, is sort of situated to respond and redirect our, our resources and our, our teams to respond to those things. Uh, but when it came to entering new countries, uh, that was um, a unique challenge for us to do that in a, in a um, rapid fashion. But we, you know, so we were mounting an emergency Ebola response, but then we were also doing two other things. The second thing was to reestablish essential health services. So in West Africa during Ebola, at the height of Ebola, really the only healthcare that was happening was Ebola. Um, and, and, and if everybody can just take a moment to try to imagine that, um, there were no safe C-sections happening. There, uh, if you were injured in an automobile crash or more likely um, you know, a, a road traffic accident involving maybe a motorcycle, um, or if you were experiencing complications of another infectious disease, there was virtually nowhere to go. The only health delivery happening in West Africa at the height of the Ebola epidemic was Ebola. And so it was very important, not just for PIH, for, 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 for many organizations and many individuals to reestablish essential health services. Um, but you couldn't do that without creating then a robust Ebola response. And then finally, the third piece, and this is the thing, this is really PIH's wheelhouse, and that is um, a, a generating a plan for a sustained uh, health system strengthening approach uh, in those countries. And I think that's where we are now in Liberia and Sierra Leone. But I spend so much time talking about that because we experienced a very similar trajectory when we entered the work here in Massachusetts. And that was um, Jim Kim sort of reaching out saying, there is a moral uh, imperative to responding to this epidemic, not just around the world, but in the United States, particularly for an organization that has experience like we do, um, responding to epidemics, understanding that model of test, trace, treat, and accompany. Um, but also he, he was making an economic argument as well. And I think we experienced that um, you know, in the first round of stimulus that came in our country. If we take a step back there and think about the amount of money it takes to, um, to respond to a crisis like this, and think about what we might have done with some of that investment decades ago without uh, sort of defunding and, and um, decimating our public health infrastructure, but continuing to build that up in the way that we, we have attempted to do around the world, we might be in a, in a different place right now. And so I think PIH was, um, was particularly interested in understanding some of this reverse innovation, heeding you know, Dr. Kim's call again, um, the, the moral imperative to, to respond, um, but also to amplify the work of public health in this response. And so, you know, um, one of the things that's been one of my challenges as uh, working through so many of the partnerships has been, uh, continually reiterating the, the excellent work of public health officials and the public health nurses and health directors and others around um, Massachusetts. We're a home rule state. We have 351 individual boards of health in Massachusetts. And so we have uh, endeavored to um, amplify the work of each of those individual local boards of health and really work in service to them. That's not been um, any different from the work that we do around the world. We always work in service to uh, a, uh, either a ministry of health or health officials at the, um, at the local level. But, um, 
you know, the way that work looks is very different in the United States compared to, uh, to the places around the world. But finally, and most importantly, in, in um, the, to PIH jumping into the deep end uh, in Massachusetts and then around the US has been our understanding that whatever the epidemic is, it will always disproportionately affect the poor and the marginalized. And, um, you know, I was on a webinar last week where I was reminded, we often talk about uh, vulnerable populations. Turns out that, that, that the, the poorest and the most marginalized uh, aren't necessarily vulnerable. They're quite resilient uh, populations of, of, of people who have been uh, systematically forced to find uh, mechanisms of resilience um, and to live within these structures of, of uh, violence and marginalization that, that we're sort of uh, implicated in perpetuating. And I think uh, as an organization, it's so um, important for us to be really, really founded and, and grounded in this idea that whatever we're doing, it will be first to the service of the poor. And I think this is one of uh, the most important pieces of, of the work that we've, we've, we try to do here in Massachusetts. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'll quickly, I, I started to mention some of this stuff. Um, so we, we've hired 1900 staff. That's not, those aren't all full-time staff and those numbers are, uh, are lower now. Fortunately, we're in a place where um, transmission in, in, of COVID in Massachusetts has trended down. Um, we're keeping a very close eye on that. And I'll also really caveat that all of these numbers um, are only inclusive of our work that we've done at the Community Tracing Collaborative. We, um, th they're not uh, aggregated with the rest of the statewide response. So there's a lot of, of numbers that aren't reflected here. So I think it's important to note, note that, uh, you know, PIH is not the source of record for the epidemiologic response in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, but we've made outreach to nearly 30,000 individuals who have tested positive uh, for COVID and a, a nearly equivalent number of, of their, con their close contacts. Uh, nearly 325,000 um, telephone calls. And um, this is all in service to those 351 local boards of health. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, this collaborative is part of, of um, it is a collaborative, and so there are many partners uh, that you can see here. So the Massachusetts Health Connector really um, holds the the over the contracts for this collaborative and serves as the um, the, the the general contractor and uh, it's sort of administrative home base for the collaborative. Uh, of course, uh, Partners in Health. We were really fortunate to receive a, a very kind donation of. Uh, human resources from Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Massachusetts, um, and uh, those partners have uh, have gone back to Blue Cross now that the numbers have have um, decreased. There are um, I forget exactly how many. Uh, my apologies, but um, at least two dozen uh, community health centers that uh, have um, provided staffing to uh, to the CTC. Um, Accenture and has been our, our technology partner, um, helping with our call center, um, contact center platform. Certainly all of uh, the work is in very close um, partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And um, then of course, all of the, um, the individual local boards of health. So there's a, there's a brief timeline there uh, on the side, but um, this all, um, came about and was uh, sort of conceived, uh, strategized and implemented in extremely short order. And so uh, Partners in Health is an organization that, um, that is comfortable in starting before others would feel that uh, they're ready. <laughs> um, but our work is to always iterate and scale um, and to, to learn and continue to, to grow as we move along. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, really briefly, why is this such an important initiative? Um, as I alluded to earlier on, contact tracing is one of the most important, uh, is one of the important pillars of an epidemic response. Uh, we've seen this tool work here in, uh, with, with partners in health and other epidemics, um, but certainly uh, public health uh, folks would agree um, that this is one of the pillars of a response to a pandemic like this. It helps us, number one, understand the, uh, where the next case may come from. Um, so by reaching out to individuals who have tested positive for COVID and understanding who they've been in close contact with, we can start to understand where those next um, cases may come from and try to break the chain of transmission. So contact tracing, uh, the goal of contact tracing is to break the chain of transmission. This photo is taken from the Maforki Ebola Treatment Unit in um, Port Loco, District of Sierra Leone. And it's another one that brings back uh, photos, it brings back a lot of memories for me. Um, okay, next slide. Um, I'll take one step back really quickly and just mention um, when I was talking about um, the our work to that, that that's founded on service to the poor and, and and marginalized communities. I think one of the most important things when I look across the different places in the United States that PIH is supporting uh, through some technical accompaniment, uh, we're always encouraging folks to do, and that is uh, the care resource coordination um, and the the number one lesson I learned about contact tracing, quarantine and isolation when working in, um, in Liberia and Sierra Leone is that you won't find success if the only tools that you're using are force and fear. Um, and so we have to use uh, not just education, but accompaniment. And uh, that means that we have to uh, continue to seek ways to, for example, engage with community health workers who are the experts at engaging with individuals in the, the setting where, uh, where they are experiencing their illness or their isolation quarantine, that we have to continue to provide for uh, the basic human rights and, and the fundamental uh, needs of human beings if we're asking them to stay home for a couple of weeks at, at a time. And this is one of the pieces that PIH has offered to the, the Community Tracing Collaborative, which has been our care resource coordination. So our care resource coordinators are uh, connecting individuals that we reach on the phone, cases and their contacts, with all the resources that they need. It's been a lot of uh, connecting with food resources, but also things like um, medication delivery, um, connecting them back to community health workers from their community, so, you know, we're doing our work virtually, but that local context is so important. So we, we connect those people back to the professionals in their communities. And, uh, and, and some of that, that resource coordination work has been even as far as preventing evictions uh, from people's homes, um, you know, helping advocate for people to keep their jobs, um, following a COVID diagnosis. Uh, this marginalization is real. Um, COVID is highlighting that uh, it's ongoing every day. And I think it's a real honor um, that Massachusetts has um, recognized our experience around the world and allowed us to be uh, a partner in, in trying to, um, in, in, in trying to uh, solve this problem here in Massachusetts and allowing our experiences that we're having here in Massachusetts to inform other uh, states around the country. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bramson. Um, thank you all so much, and I'm looking forward to your questions in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, my name is Bob Bramson, and I'm a case investigator for the um, task force in Massachusetts. And, a couple questions that are always asked me by my friends is, one, why did I become a case investigator and how does it really work? And, and um, you know, I like 
all of you initially were, were um, uh, confronted with a confusing story from the media and a kind of an absent leadership as to how we're going to attack this problem. And, and, and in fact, you and I would read in the news that there was a lack of understanding about the effects of the pandemic and, and even some questions whether it was important or not. And, and so at least I and my colleagues um, felt kind of helpless by this, this, this um, uh, situation and the lack of, of ability or to do anything. And then all at once, we heard in the news that, that Jim Kim had talked to Governor Baker and, and Baker had agreed to spend money and had asked uh, the partners in health to um, establish the, the, um, um, oh, the overall task force. Oh, can I have the next slide, please? And, and um, um, so, so what happened was a call went out um, for a thousand people to join this uh, contact tracing program. And so I said, gee, um, you know, I know a little bit about that. And I suspect, are they gonna want some people with some medical experience and maybe even uh, some leadership experience or to help mentor these new people? And the call went out for a thousand people. I'll tell you parenthetically that 25,000 people answered the call. Um, but, but my a particular situation was I applied, or they asked me to read some information and take a test on that particular information, and I did. And the very next day, I got an email that said, can you sit for about a 30-minute online interview to become a case investigator? And I said, sure. So I went through um, a really a rather good um, 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 case investigator interview. And the very next day, um, I got another email that said, we'd like to offer you a job. Can you start tomorrow? And I said, oh, OK. So, so, so the very next day, I went to work. And I spent two and a half days learning how to use this huge um, um, computer data system in which every person in Massachusetts who tests positive for the coronavirus, their name and contact information is entered into the, a database. And let me tell you that the, uh, you know, it's not that I'm particularly dumb at learning this and it took two and a half days. This is a very confusing type of a, a database, not because um, it was poorly designed, but because everybody understood that we were kind of inventing it as we rolled along. In fact, the analogy was it's like trying to build an airplane and put uh, the wings on it where we're actually flying through the air. So, so, so everybody kind of understood uh, this was a, a process we were gonna have to learn as we went ahead. So the very first day I actually started to call people. My job was to call people who had tested positive and I have a um, computer that, that, that has got me the contact information. And then I enter um, oh, the information that I obtained from these people. Now, initially, um, when I would make the calls, the people I was calling were, were um, confused, frightened, in some cases, even terrified. They, they too had been confused by the news media, or they didn't know what to expect. One, they were a little, uh, a little suspicious of who was I. Uh, uh, um, and so I spent a lot of time uh, talking to these people, trying to alleviate their anxiety. And I would say the average conversation took at least 30 minutes. Sometimes it took a little bit longer. And we'd engage in long conversations. And I would establish some uh, rapport. And during that conversation, I would ask them a series of symptoms. And I'd list the symptoms in the computer database. And I would also then ask them who had they personally contacted in the 48 hours prior to the time they became positive for the virus. Um, and they would give me all this information and I would dump it into the computer. And then I'd spend some time trying to get them to relax and tell them that we were going to be there to help them. John has alluded to the fact that, that um, um, uh, we have what we call um, CRCs that you can, you can see on the slide up there, 
those are the people who are, are capable of um, providing resources. So one of the questions I would ask uh, the people, I told them oh, the way to isolate for 14 days. And, and one of the questions I'd ask is, do you have enough food and medication, et cetera? And as they would tell me what they did or didn't have, um, if, if oh, they needed a, um, a resource, I would put this in the computer so that we knew that the uh, computer resource people uh, were going to be able to contact them and take uh, care of them. And I, would, uh, and I would assure the people this was going to happen. Let me tell you that, that, that the reaction of the people, um, uh, these are people now who are testing positive for the virus, was almost universally a thank you. And, 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 and I would tell them at the end of the conversation, I'm going to call you back tomorrow. Uh, or to check on how you're doing. There was a little bit of surprise at this, uh, but then when I would really call them back the next day to see how they were doing, there was not only surprise, but there was gratitude. And, and more than once, they, they thanked me for checking in. And the reason I was checking in was I want to see if the symptoms were progressing. Were they getting worse? Were they getting better? Did they need something they hadn't initially anticipated? That was uh, basically of the way I did it. All of the contact information that I put into the computer is then distributed to people who work with me, the actual contact tracers that you see on that slide. And they would uh, then do the same type of investigation and contact the people who hadn't tested positive, but they had been in touch with people who had tested positive and um, get them to isolate. And uh, can I have the next slide, please? And, and, and um, I guess I've already said all that. I have a number of stories that I could share, but, but we'll, move, uh, we'll move on and let you um, ask whatever of your questions or you'd like. Mitch or somebody? <laughs> or Steve? I'll start with uh, a question we've received. Um, and and you, you've talked about these hundreds of thousands of additional calls that you've made. And we have a question, which I believe is, because as I understand it, all the referrals you get initially are people who have tested positive. So in these additional calls, how many more people are you finding that take a test and test positive? And is the number changing? Is it going up or down over time? Uh, Steve, let me uh, try to answer that. When I would call a person who tests positive, um, usually the most common contacts were those who might live with that particular individual. Um, but um, well, we tried to search out who had you seen in the 48 hours prior to becoming positive. We call those contacts. And I would say the average person that I spoke with uh, could probably give me three to four names, sometimes as many as five or six names. Sometimes they only said it's the people I live with. Those are the additional calls uh, to the contacts. And then the contacts in turn might, uh, might provide the names and contact information for additional folks. Um, one question that we just got that I, I must say is fascinating to me as well. Uh, this is a huge and complicated enterprise culturally. How did you just deal with the number of languages and the needed language skills so that you could effectively communicate with people what it was you were trying to do, what you wanted them to do, et cetera? Good question. I was on, um, I'm, I'm a member of what's called Team 6, and Team 6 is um, Springfield and the surrounding area. And, and um, um, so happens uh, that I was fortunate uh, to have on my particular unit two people who were fluent in Spanish and one who was fluent in Portuguese and a and, and number of others. But as we encountered people who, um, who spoke a language of which I was not fluent and, and, and the only language I speak well is uh, probably English, uh, um, um, there's a way that I can contact on my computer translators. And so I was able to say to them, uh, um, can you hold on for a minute while I get a translator? And, and, and uh, there's a process 
whereby I can contact a translator, and then it's a three-way call, me, or the translator, and or the individual who's testing positive. So then if you, for to use the example that you gave yourself then, to do a follow-up call the next day, would you start it and the translator would be on the call with you? Yes, yes, I would, I, I, I would then, on all the follow-ups, I would, and, and I'd usually use the same translator uh, if I possibly could, so that, so that um, um, oh, the people were comfortable and they were familiar with the fact that oh, the same people were trying to contact them each day. I'll also, um, Steve, I'll jump in and just say sure. that uh, we went to some length to, um, to recruit uh, individuals who spoke languages that are more common here in Massachusetts. Um, so we have uh, quite a few folks who speak Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, um, and in the technology solution that uh, Dr. Bramson was describing, um, we're creating mechanisms in there that, that language cues can be created. So, you know, when, when a, a language that identified, the first um, attempt will be for that person to speak one-on-one, uh, -on -one, not through an interpreter, but, but individually. And we also um, have capacity to, um, to manage uh, phone calls with uh, the deaf and hard of hearing as well. So um, really an important, um, great question, an important uh, piece of, of the work is communication. Um, to either of you, uh, another question that we've gotten, um, of all the people whom you contact, uh, Dr. Welch emphasized earlier in his presentation how disproportionate, disproportionate numbers of, uh, of these people are poor or marginalized somehow. How many of them, as a practical matter, did in fact need uh, just things like food assistance uh, because they were being asked to stay home? I mean, it, it would strike me that it might be a very large number. It might not be at all just an occasional need. Yeah, uh, great question. So. Uh, from our early analysis, it looks like uh, at least 15% of individuals that we reach uh, required some sort of resource coordination. Um, a, a vast majority of those folks were uh, requiring food assistance. Um, and, you know, it'd be very interesting to us, though we, we've not um, done this analysis. Um, but to, to try to understand who was sort of living on the precipice of food insecurity to begin with, right? And to understand the, uh, the effect of a, uh, a COVID diagnosis and really tipping someone over that. We know so many people live on this razor thin edge uh, between, um, you know, food security and insecurity and, um, and, and uh, also, I'll just say, you know, the, the, the poverty line in Massachusetts is really quite low. It's, it's incredible to think about how uh, folks survive um, to begin with. And so uh, we were actually expecting even more individuals would require um, the resource coordination than, than what we've seen. Uh, but we continue to, to do that analysis and it's been, I'll say from, um, from Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters, uh, their um, full support of this idea of resource coordination and making sure people can get tied back to the resources that exist in their communities has been uh, sensational. And also that that, um, that level of understanding uh, the need for resources uh, has not been, been echoed in other states where we've been asked to provide guidance. Um, we really have great uh, leadership here in Massachusetts and each time the secretary checks in with uh, how the CTC is doing, the question goes back to what, you know, are we maintaining an equity lens? Um, and I think one of the most important things about PIH is that we can, um, we can often, we can always answer yes, because that's kind of how we're were found it so I wonder if I could just well, follow just up jump a little in bit oh, sure go right ahead well, let me just jump in and reinforce what John just said I had a 23 year old um, woman who was a mother of an 18 month old child and after talking to her initially she told me that she had enough food 
for a day and a half for the child, but considerably less for herself. And so uh, we explored that and I'm uh, recording a data. I was able to get the a resource coordinator involved with her and that resource coordinator later got back with me and told me that not only did the mother not have enough food for herself, but her rent was due and she had no money. So, so all of these things were coordinated by these, these uh, community resource coordinators and um, candidly, oh, they took excellent care of the mother and the 18 month old. But yes, there are a lot of people who live on the border of uh, poverty in this state. Um, maybe just one uh, further detail, for, uh, uh, if I might. Um, I'm surprised that the number was so low. When you asked people uh, about their food needs, for example, did you find nonetheless that a number of other people already were getting some kind of assistance from the various institutions that we have in Boston or in other big cities to help people with food security? Eve, I think that's a great question. Um, and, and really helps us uh, echo, again, this idea of, of the local health departments. Um, you know, contact tracing and all of, the, all of the things that surround contact tracing are not new concepts. And local health departments uh, carry out these activities on a daily basis for 90 other reportable infectious diseases. Um, uh, you know, from foodborne illness to, um, you know, to STIs and others. So, um, so this work has, has been ongoing. We've been here to just uh, amplify the, the work at the local level, and that includes the resource coordination. So I think you're absolutely right that a number of individuals um, were, were receiving that support or had received that outreach from early, um, from early interactions with their local health departments. Um, your uh, remark, John, about the uh, number of other things that local health boards are uh, tracing actually is a great opportunity to answer, a, I think, a very basic question uh, that somebody in our audience asked that I'd, I'd like you to talk about. What's a contact? Uh, do you consider, for example, an interaction in a store or a post office, something that needs to be traced? How do you decide, once people tell you the number of people they've been in touch with, who needs to be traced and who doesn't? Yeah, great question, and and I'm happy to answer it. But maybe I'll I'll send it over to Dr. Um, Bramson, who spends his day speaking with folks. Doing this them, exactly. Yeah, helping them discern those questions. Well, it really is a good question, and, and it's and, and it's a question that 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 um, comes up actually talking to the people. Uh, they say, well, well, um, what is a contact? And, and, and so. Um, I suppose it varies a little bit between people, but what we're advised to is if you've been within six feet of a person um, in the 48 hours prior to becoming testing, if you can possibly give me their contact information, that's what I need. Now, they'll ask, I've been in a store and, and there've been people all over, and my answer is, no, don't worry about that too much, but, but, but if you were talking to um, a friend or um, speaking directly to an individual within six feet, we consider that a contact. But, but just walking around a store, not talking to anybody, um, uh, you know, ideally, I suppose you, you might try to get that, but that was not information we were able uh, to How obtain. about to use the store example, though, a checkout counter? Um, You're well, so often that close. Yeah, there's what we call um, a congregate living or congregate space. And, and, and so if we found a spot where, where a lot of people were um, going to a store and talking to the same individuals, we might refer that to the supervisors who in turn would refer to that to the local board of health and maybe they would check in and take a look at that particular location. As a collective matter. Yes. I see. Let's, uh, let's shift also, to a, a diff, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I'll also say that um, we also consider time an important element of close contact. So, you know, six feet is an important um, distance. And uh, we're, we're thinking about people who have been within six feet uh, for 15 minutes or more as being a, a very close contact. Um, so those time and duration are critical. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. 
Let's uh, shift to another uh, question that somebody's asked. Apparently, there was an article recently in, in the New York Times uh, indicating that in New York, there was some difficulty getting information from people who test positive. There was a relatively low rate of response. Is that different in Massachusetts? Are you getting a better rate of response? And if you are getting a better rate, to what do you attribute that? Great question. I think, um, number one, if we, if we think about the way I read that, I read that piece as well. Well, a lot of us have had uh, a number of interactions about that piece this, this weekend. Um, you wanna know what measure they're using. Um, so if they're, if they're using simply a pickup rate, a telephone pickup rate, um, you know, Bob could share with you that we don't call someone once and if we fail to reach them, call it over. Um, we call them back multiple times, uh, different times of day. We leave voicemails. Um, we also, in automated text messages sent before Bob even gets that telephone number um, to say, hey, we're going to try and reach out to you. Um, so if you're, if you're talking about just the pickup rate, uh, it's a little bit of a false uh, measure of, of success because, you know, we do call so many times. Um, but if you're looking at um, our, our overall failure to connect with someone, um, in Massachusetts, that's, that's less than 10%. So um, we eventually reach uh, close to 95% of everyone we try to get in touch with. Now- Of your referrals. Of our referrals. Um, sometimes that takes a day or two, but by and large that happens really in the first day. Um, it took us some time to get to that maturity, right? Dr. Bramson <laughs> described the, uh, the building the plane as we're flying it. Um, and so, but the most important thing of this whole, of, of the whole endeavor has been um, teaching the public about public health, right? We understand what contact tracing is and we understand why it's so important. However, particularly in our country where we are so reliant upon acute care and we're so reliant upon, you know, if you have a health problem, you see a doctor, you see a doctor usually in a hospital uh, and you receive some sort of prescription or treatment for it. Public health intervention starts with education. Um, and, you know, this is why in PIH's uh, COVID response in West Africa, uh, a nation that's less than a decade away from a ter another terrible epidemic, uh, when we explained, okay, you know, uh, how would a test trace treat and, and uh, a company model work for COVID in West Africa, all of our colleagues there said, we got it. And the public said, we understand. Because they understand what the pillars of a public health response are. And so the first effort in the United States and for any, any um, municipality that's trying to set up a big uh, contact tracing effort like this, the first thing you have to do and the thing you have to be most patient with is educating people what uh, contact tracing is. Let's uh, shift to another uh, kind of category of, of questions. And these are, I think, two kind of interrelated matters. Uh, first off, um, and to both of you, one in terms of the program design and then in terms of in the trenches, uh, tell us about how uh, uh, your various contacts immigration status figured in all of this. How did you deal with that? What differences in their responses might there have been in their or ongoing receptivity? Uh, and also in terms of uh, availability of services because many of the services to which people are entitled if they are residents, uh, they are not entitled to if they are not residents. Uh, great question, a, 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 a tricky topic, uh, particularly in this time in history. Um, we have uh, worked hard to engage with organizations who have close uh, relationships with the undocumented community. And even while we may not have had uh, great success with all of them in terms of uh, contact tracing through this, this virtual effort, um, we have been able to continually refer those folks back to 
their local health department. Uh, many local health departments are aware of these communities in their, uh, within their um, municipality and have techniques to reach them. Um, and it, th this goes back to really that, that accompaniment model, which is that it, it won't be a, a technological solution or um, even a virtual solution to reach uh, a population that, that, you know, leadership in our country has just really, really uh, instilled terrible fear. Um, it, it has to be a human connection um, and usually it has to be face-to-face. Uh, -face. And so our uh, approach in that realm has been um, to really engage with health departments to try and reach those folks. I don't know if, if, if Bob wants to speak to any of his experience on the phone, um, but it's been much more of the traditional uh, public health work, which is face-to-face. -face. Yeah, let me just add, um, um, oh, the very important point is that regardless of your, of your immigration status, if you're positive for this virus, we have to um, assume you're uh, a, a part of the population. We have to do the contact tracing, et cetera. Um, to my knowledge, it never came up as a problem. Now, we had a lot of people that we're pretty sure were probably undocumented um, people, but, but as John has articulated, uh, um, we were able to persuade them that the, well, the information they were giving us was confidential. It would be put in the um, Massachusetts Department of Health as confidential, and they or, or were not allowed by law to share this with ICE or anybody else. So, so it occasionally took some reassurance, um, and, and I suppose they might have been skeptical, uh, but, but in most cases, we were able to persuade them that this was not something that they were going to hear from an ICE agent knocking on the door the next day. And then the related question, um, it, Massachusetts is a state now where many, in fact, most people have at least some kind of health insurance. To what extent was insurance coverage even an issue for you? Or is that kind of a sidebar consideration that is not nearly as important as dealing with the uh, emergent public health issues. John, you want to answer that? Sure. Um, so you're you're right, Steve, that um, we're in a unique position uh, here in Massachusetts compared to other other states. Um, that being said, our um, our care resource coordinators, while they themselves were not set up to um, you know, to sign folks up for health insurance. Um, we connected those individuals who needed uh, that assistance with, um, with the connector and others who could help them get, uh, get signed up for mass health or other uh, insurance. And then um, it's also been important to try to refer folks to testing that's free um, because by and large, it's the, it's the testing piece um, that's been so important. Um, so, we, we ourselves don't uh, uh, have not offered the service of signing folks up, but we can refer them uh, and accompany them to the, the places that can. And, and from our early work in other states, uh, a much bigger issue in other states than, than here in Massachusetts. Actually, we just have a question about that. And I, I wonder if you could kind of address this issue of what are you learning in Massachusetts and what, if, what to what extent, what to whatever extent you can tell us about what you may be doing in other states, how replicable is what you're doing in Massachusetts, which has, as we just said, very high level of insurance, very, you know, at least arguably by comparison, relatively abundant uh, social programs and other social infrastructure to help people uh, and quite benign attitudes compared to other states about immigration. How, how do all of those factors moving south, uh, maybe even literally, uh, make replication much more difficult? Well, I think, I mean, we can take this question two different ways. We can be very pragmatic about it, but we can also just zoom out and, and, and ask the question, you know, 
of the leaders in those different states, what, what's your goal here, right? Is your goal re-election or is your goal to end the COVID epidemic, pandemic, right? And I think that will guide us towards uh, the answer to our, our questions. We see that as a, at a national level as well, you know, um, pandering to this idea that somehow uh, the, the pandemic is a political, uh, it, it is a political matter when in reality it's a public health matter and should be handled in that in that way. So our, our challenges um, are unique based on the, the geography. Uh, I will say that PIH is not hiring staff or employing uh, teams of folks the way that we are here in Massachusetts in other states. We're providing um, technical accompaniment and some lessons learned, uh, helping um, folks think through their technological solutions, um, and then trying to provide some color around our model and around our ethos, um, which has a lot to do with uh, making sure you're reaching the most, um, the most marginalized. Um, the challenges are, as you can imagine them, um, you know, I'm not speaking out of turn, here to say, for example, in Ohio, the state where I grew up, um, there was uh, legislation, fortunately, was not passed in the Senate, but the uh, state uh, House of Representatives introduced legislation that would have required a signed consent before contact tracing could be carried out. And, you know, Bob could probably attest to the challenges that would offer in uh, what we talk about, sort of the timing cascade there is a critical window of time that you've got to reach that contact um, before- Reach them on a trust level, not just reach them, get them to trust you. Exactly, and when you introduce, that's exactly right. And when you start to introduce these little seeds of doubt into the system, including this idea of, well, if I have to con sign consent, then there might be something nefarious here, or there might be something you know, that might be a little bit off. Um, and, and I'll just say that um, uh, confidentiality and data security is, are two of the most important aspects of this work. And I will uh, tip my hat to the, 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 the colleagues at the Mass Department of Public Health who worked so hard from the beginning um, to make sure that we were uh, in line with all of the regulation to make sure every everywhere along the line that that, that data security and that the privacy was was um, those regulations were followed. Um, so you know I think when there's lack of political will to go back to the original question when there's lack of political will then there's lack of of uh, you know uh, appropriations of, of, of dollars. Um, and therefore, there's a, a, health, a public health response that's out of balance. Um, there, early on, there was this attempt that sort of the, the panacea was testing, right? But testing doesn't make sense if it's not connected to tracing and treatment, right? There's also, there, there's always this um, idea that we can forego treatment if we just mitigate everything, right? Um, there's always a conversation in these circumstances I've experienced the same thing during Ebola about um, herd immunity. Herd immunity is the concept that, uh, you know, a critical mass of people are infected such that there's now a majority of folks, it's gotta be around 70% of individuals who've been infected who now have antibodies and therefore uh, everyone else is sort of protected. This is the concept of vaccination campaigns but it's not through vaccination, it's through infection. But what that fails to recognize is that uh, to achieve herd immunity, particularly with an illness like uh, COVID, um, millions of people will die. And as we've seen the trend here uh, with COVID and with most other epidemics is that poor and marginalized individuals, particularly people of color, will be, uh, will be killed by the virus for those with means to achieve uh, herd immunity. And so we, we as an organization, unfortunately, I think as a state, 
um, reject that as as a um, as a way forward. Um, so so those are the challenges I think wherever um, wherever we work. It, Two final questions, if I may. Um, and they both have to do with a certain kinds of loosening. You've seen more political activism lately, where in the political season, we may well see a great deal more. Uh, what implications, if any, does that have uh, for what you do? And generally, what does the whole loosening process, we're now in phase 2B in Massachusetts, uh, people are gradually, and more and more of us are thinking about, okay, maybe I've had enough of lockdown, what are the safe things I can do? How will that affect your program? So, again, sort of two responses to that. The first is that we're, uh, as scary as it is, this is a big social experiment, right? Where we look, we have to look at our society and decide, you know, will we maintain this degree of civility that, and these, this civil agreement, which is that, uh, as a beneficiary of living in this type of society, I am responsible then not just for my own health and wellness, but for that of others, right? This is part of our social contract to say, um, wearing a mask or staying home when it's, when it's, uh, when it's possible, uh, washing my hands, these sorts of things, those things may not just be uh, good for me, but for the, for the betterment of, of our entire society. So I think that's the first and most important thing is that, um, you know, we have to agree that being an active participant in the COVID response is part of our responsibility to care for each other. Um, you know, this is about being a good neighbor and a good member of society. Number one. Number two, what does this mean for our actual day-to-day -day work? Um, we, we've all watched the trends in Massachusetts and we're kind of, um, we continue to, to have a downward trend. The cases continue to um, stay pretty low. Um, you know, even a single death of COVID is, um, is terrible, but those numbers continue, uh, deaths per day by COVID continue to be uh, lower than they've been, which is, uh, is good to see. Um, so we're looking, you know, we're looking at refining our processes. Um, we're looking at making sure that we can continue to be here to support um, all of the local health departments who have, uh, when the numbers were very high, needed that extra support. Um, and also, we're here to, um, you know, for the foreseeable future to support the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, should they, should we see a, a surge in cases? I don't think we're gonna see an acute surge. Um, I think we will see numbers start to, uh, to increase a little bit. That will be by virtue of people having more contacts uh, per case. Um, but I think that we're prepared for that. And also, it, it's been good to see that um, individual, or it's been good to see that the public health metrics and the epidemiology seem to be what's driving the timeline for reopening. Uh, there are places where it seems quite arbitrary, and that doesn't, uh, it doesn't strike me as, as such here in Massachusetts. Bob, let me uh, finally uh turn to you as the person in the field. As we start to reopen, are you seeing the number of contacts per, per, per your referral go up? Um, well, let me answer it this way. See, we are seeing a, a distinct downturn in the number of cases that uh, get dumped into our computer. Um, I suspect a lot of that has to do with the fact more people are, are going outside um, and, and those activities that they are starting to go back to tend to be more outside. Um, I personally think that the danger is going to become as we get into the fall when people start going back inside and then they're doing other things that they've 
uh, wanted oh, oh, to do, I suspect that's when we're going to really see uh, the upturn in the number of cases. Well, I think on that uncertain note, it's a good place to end. We are pretty much out of questions and we are out over our even the overage time that we allowed for. So uh, I guess we are back to Mitchell. That's it. Program done. Nice job. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. See Thanks, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye now.